Uh, I want to talk to you about climate science. Um, you're going to see some of the features in Tableau, how you can interpret data, and where there are limitations in our understanding and it's difficult to make interpretations. I collected data on the world population, on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and on temperatures around the world. And I, I did, did a little bit of the engineering in R just to clean it up a bit, because if you want to compare this data, they have to all be, I had to make sure they were all by years instead of by days or months. And I got all of this data from Kaggle.com. Let's talk about the carbon dioxide for a little bit. So carbon dioxide is measured in parts per million. Now, in theory, this is the best data that we could get for CO2 in the atmosphere. It's supposed to be a really good representative sample. It's supposed to be representative of the CO2 worldwide without a lot of contamination from local factors. So that's the theory. So I'll read this verbatim. Scientists make atmospheric measurements in remote locations to sample air that's representative a large volume of the Earth's atmosphere it should be free from local influences. So this is supposed to be really good reliable data and you can actually take a look at it and you can see that it's really stable. I used to wonder for a long time how can you possibly estimate CO2 in the whole atmosphere? Is there a lot of variance? Because this is supposed to be a quality sample that's representative of the whole atmosphere but if you wanted to verify that, you would need to actually make measurements in other parts around the world and see if they're really similar. But they might not be. I don't know if they did that. So I also got uh, data for temperatures all around the world. And it goes back to the early 18th century. Here's a temperature timeline, and this is global from 1960 to around 2013. Now. One thing that I did was I filtered all the data to only start in 1960, and that's because I'm really skeptical about claims that we know what the temperature was in the 18th century. <laughs> so notice this is a rabbit hole because every question just leads to more questions. Like how, how do they measure this stuff? Who was measuring the temperature in every country around the world back in the 18th century? Because there's no way that happened and there's no way someone actually found all those data sources and compiled it. Like, that didn't happen. Uh, what's weirder yet is that there are scientists who claim that they can tell you what the temperature was globally thousands of years ago by looking at tree rings <laughs> or by looking at dirt. Like, they can dig six feet into the ground and when they look at the soil, they can <laughs> they can tell you what the temperature was 4,000 years ago. It's completely ridiculous. But the thing is, when people from the science, science community make claims, the public don't have the resources, the education, the patience, or the, the ambition to vet anything that they say. And that's a real problem because when I hear them say that they can tell you what the temperature was like thousands of years ago or what CO2, density there was thousands of years ago, that's that's as blatantly ridiculous as if the scientists told us that pigs could fly. They could tell us anything if the public go along with it. And part of that is because it's a cultural thing where you're called a science denier if you don't accept ludicrous things on face value without questioning it. Anyway, I filtered out all the data before 1960 because, yeah, I wanted to work with just reliable data. Another reason though was because I wanted to make sure that all three of these timelines covered the same dates. Before I get to population temperature, I made a temperature heat map. You can actually see and it's color coded, that's what a heat map means. You can see the temperatures for various countries. So Greenland is very cold, which you know, you can see that. What's weird though is Denmark is also really cold. And I saw that and I thought, why is Denmark so cold compared to surrounding countries? I think that it might have something to do with its geography, because it's like right in the middle of the channel and it has lots of shoreline. Like you would think Norway or England would be cold too by that rationale. Mexico, we're looking at a median temperature annually of 22. I think that's Celsius. 
So I'm just gonna say Celsius. I don't know. But take a look at these countries in Africa. These these have median annual temperatures of almost 30. So 22 compared to 30, it's unbelievable. When you think about how hot Mexico is, imagine how hot it must be to live in these countries. Interesting features that you can put in for Tableau are filters. Let's do at least, and let's start at 1960. Yeah, because again, I don't trust anyone's measurements of what the temperature was centuries ago, let alone thousands of years ago. Um, now, don't get me wrong. So, people say there was an ice age thousands of years ago. First of all, you could know there's an ice age by looking at historical records, and I think that would be a lot more reliable. So that's one way they know. I'm open to the idea that if they analyze sediment, like old, really old sediment, that they might be able to figure out there was an ice age. But that's because an ice age that's a huge outlier, right? What I what I object to is how narrow their confidence interval seems to be. Like if they're going to tell you they know what the median temperature was that year, no way. Thousands of years ago? No, no. It's like the further back you go in time, the wider the confidence intervals are. So it, they're definitely overstating their certainty. Or it, Sometimes it's not that the scientists are overstating their certainty, sometimes it's the media that doesn't report it as well as they ought to. Like a scientist might say, hey, here's my hypothesis, I kind of think this might be true, let's look into it. But the media don't report it that way. The media will report it as, this is what the scientists are saying. So, in general, the scientists are a lot more scrupulous and conservative in their claims. Let's take a look at a heat map for population. And as you can see, I picked red for a reason, it stands out. And you can see the two countries stand out a lot. China and India. Here's something interesting. I didn't realize this until literally right now. India is has almost the same population as China. And it only has like a third of the area. That's crazy because it wasn't like that back in the day. Uh, 1960, you can see that China had a significantly larger population. How much? It had like 150, almost 150% 150 of the population of India. So India, if we, if we go back in time to 2017, India has almost closed the gap completely. So, I mean, there's, there's an upper limit on population based on a lot of factors, like based on culture, um, birth control. The more advanced you get, the fewer kids people have because there's um, lower child mortality rates um, and also, of course, natural resources on population density. So eventually, eventually the, India is going to reach its cap pretty soon. I don't know who has more natural resources to support a large population. I don't know that because, of, well, I don't know anything about their economies. So, if you looked at surface area, you might think that's a predictor, but not really, because you know, <laughs> look at the population in Canada. That they have 10% of the U.S. population, even though they have a lot of area. Just because they have a lot of area doesn't mean you have a lot of natural resources, not necessarily. So, I also constructed three dashboards in Tableau to show this information. So here we have a temperature timeline. Um, oh, yeah. So this is actually a really cool feature. So I'm going to, I've already set this to use this as a filter. So uh, that means if I click a certain point in this timeline, in this case, uh, 1968, this map, this heat map updates to show you the, what the global temperatures were in 1968. So. If I click here, you're going to see the data changes. Very subtle shifts in color around Europe that I noticed. And then if we go present day, that's a huge difference. Whoa. <laughs> so, getting hot in here, right? The difference was that Canada and Russia used to, <clears throat> they used to have negative medium temperatures. But then if we fast forward in time, now they don't. Now it's positive. Tableau notices that there's a variable here on the x-axis that says year, and Tableau also knows that the data in our heat map uh, can be based on year. 
because there's a year variable um, in this data set. And so if you use this as a filter, and then you select specific information, it'll update it here as well. So Tableau notices that just from noticing that the variable names are the same. So there's a lot of amazing features here, actually. It's a very intuitive program. They, you could tell that the developers wanted it to be as intuitive as possible. So Tableau does a lot of the legwork for you. You can also link data sets. Um, in fact, in the description, I'm just going to put a link to a tutorial that I learned from to do some of this stuff, which is a great tutorial to start with. So here, we're going to take a look at the dashboard for population. So again, I did the same thing where I set, I set the timeline as a filter. And so that means if I select certain data, the population map will update. Now the differences are really subtle, uh, and that's because the heat map is showing populations relatively. So if if you go into the future, the relative populations aren't actually changing very much. Well, actually, I think I noticed a difference. So notice Russia looks a lot lighter. The reason for that must be that the Russian population uh, is did not grow nearly as fast as the rest of the world. That's what that means. Last thing we're going to take a look at are side-by-side -side timelines for population, CO2, and temperature, just to see if there are any connections here. Let's see if we can learn anything. I set the population timeline to be used as a filter. That means if I select certain years, the data here will update. So do we see any patterns? Well, notice that population is growing at a very steady rate. And you would expect that because it's global. So there's not gonna be a lot of variance in global population growth rate. Same thing with CO2, because of the because it was a quality sample, we're just seeing steady growth, very little variation. Temperature, that's actually really weird. It surprises me that there's a lot of variance. There's a lot more variance in temperature than in CO2 or population. And I'm not really sure what to make of that. Bear in mind, we're talking about global median annual temperatures. So that's a lot of variance, actually. There's, here's an old adage that everyone should be aware of when they're looking at data. A correlation does not prove causation. And so what can we actually learn from looking at this data? All we know from this data is that population CO2 and temperature are all increasing. Does that mean they're increasing because of each other? could be, or it could be that they're in, they're all increasing because of some other factor. We don't know. We really don't know how these variables interact. Now scientists, they, try, they make a claim, for example, that if you increase CO2, you're going to increase temperature. Claims like that are true theoretically, uh, but in the real world, when you're talking about a complex system, the more variables there are, the more difficult it is to predict how they're going to interact. Um, and we know that's true because whenever whenever scientists make predictive models, their predictive models are always wrong. And that's because predictive models are ridiculous. They simply don't work. They only work in a simple system. So in a simple system, when you have very few variables, uh, you're able to capture most of the explanatory information in the variables in your model. And that works. But when you're talking about a complex system like the entire atmosphere, how many variables are you talking about? Way too many to count. There are variables that are interacting that we don't even comprehend. There are too, so many variables, there's no way you could capture the complexity uh, of that system with a, a model. A model simply doesn't capture. And that's not my opinion. We know that's true because their predictive models are always wrong. Um, another example where predictive models don't work is with uh, COVID-19. So with COVID-19, they keep saying, hey, here's our new predictive model, but it's ridiculous because your predictive model, first, it would have to be applied on a country by country basis because all these different countries are enforcing different policies. And second of all, the rate at which the infection spreads is going to depend on what policy 
policies are in place then, and you don't know how the country is going to change its policies. So anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. I was just trying to broadly make the point that time series don't work. So we really don't know any complex system how to forecast values. It can't be done. It's very dodgy science. It's, it's just guesswork. It's you're basically making an educated guess, which is which is only going to work if the variables stay the same, and the variables aren't going to stay the same. So, but whatever, man. We've learned that population's going up steadily, so is CO2. And the temperature is also seems to be going up, but it's going up with way more variance. And what accounts for all that variance? I don't really know. I, I think that I think that a scientist, there are plenty of scientists who would have a better understanding of what's causing all this variance, but clearly a hurricane or a tornado would affect local temperature. But what I don't understand is what's causing all this variance on a global basis? Local events shouldn't shouldn't really skew the data this much, right? But something is skewing the data. So 